this is uh, Going Back, Remembering UGA, Part 2 interview with Dan McGill, conducted by Fran Lane on May 9, 2006. Are we ready to go? Can we just get started? Yes. Coach, let's just jump right back into this. Uh, let's, uh, you know, there are some things that I would imagine that our current students would not have an idea ever happened on this campus. Some things that they would re be surprised about, interested in, and one of those things would be that we had a, we had cavalry here on our campus. Could you? Talk we about certainly that? did for many years. Uh, they had the cavalry, ROTC, and uh, uh, they rode the horses and had the drills on a field that was right back of the military building that's still there on Baldwin Street in front of Park Hall. But in back, there was a flat area where the infantry drilled and where the cavalry drilled. And I, um, all Southern boys, I think most Southern boys, wanted to be in the ROTC cavalry. And uh, ROTC was required in those days in high school and college. They didn't have cavalry in high school, but they certainly had it available in all the big colleges, as well as infantry. And now, of course, they have Air Force too. But um, all Southern boys wanted to be in cavalry, most of them, because they remember the great history of the uh, war between the states, and the South certainly had the greatest cavalry d divisions. Uh, Lee's great cavalry leader was Jeb Stuart, and um, he was killed in uh, May 1964, um, and it was a great loss when he was killed leading the charge. And then Nathan Bedford Forrest was a great cavalry leader. Uh, uh, William, uh, General William Tecumseh Sherman thought he was the greatest cavalry leader he had ever seen. He called him that devil uh, Forrest. And uh, uh, after the war, uh, and being interviewed one time, uh, a writer asked uh, General Forrest what he attributed his success to. And he says, I always believed in getting the firstest with the mostest. And then uh, I, in particular, I, uh, wanted to be in the cavern not only because of the tradition of Jeb Stewart and uh, General Nathan Bedford Forrest, but because of Tennyson's great poem, The Charge of the Light Brigade. That was such a wonderful poem about the British uh, brigade that was wiped out, I believe, uh, fighting the Russians in an old war. But, um, and I was in the cavalry class at Georgia, but I didn't get a commission in the cavalry because to get a commission in the summertime, you had to go to Fort Oglethorpe up there near Chattanooga every summer. I spent every summer running the Georgia tennis courts in front of LeConte Hall in those days. But I did get a commission in the United States Marine Corps, but we didn't have any cavalry. And I'm glad we didn't want, wouldn't want to make a cavalry charge in World War II against tanks. Talk a little bit, Coach, about where uh, the, the physical setup, the horses, you had uh, mentioned oh, yeah. at one point the... the uh, the horses we had wouldn't have been able to lead much of the charge. They were old horses. The younger horses were at bases where they would go <laughs> be needed in case they were used in war. These were old horses, and the stables were located almost where the Georgia Continuing Education Center building is. But I remember we would ride the horses out into, oh, just for miles in the south part of the campus. And well, Georgia's acreage, the University of Georgia's acreage, I've been told, is the most acreage of any university in the United States. But it was, uh, there were no buildings where we rode, no paved road. We just rode through the fields and then rode back. I, I haven't been on a horse since then. That was 1941. Well, we, we are now talking about. Uh, uh, days of the past at the university. Uh, one of the other things that you had mentioned to me was a visit by Franklin Delano Roosevelt to campus, who was uh, only... He, I think he is the only sitting president who has ever uh, visited the campus and made a speech. 
Uh, I think it was in the summer, late summer of 19, I know it was in the late summer of 1936. He was to come here and get a, an honorary degree. It also was in the summer when he had begun campaigning for his second term as president. And uh, my father was editor of the Athens Banner Herald at that time. I was a 15-year-old boy, and he, he says, I could go with him down to the train station at the end of College Avenue and um, watch um, President Roosevelt get off the train and get in a convertible and ride to the field. Well, my father also was a friend of Governor um, Ed Rivers, and, uh, and uh, he was down there with Governor Rivers, who was giving the President a state welcome. And while I was there, just uh, eavesdropping to what my father was saying to Governor Rivers and others. Uh, Governor Rivers gave me a $10 bill. It may have been a $5 bill, but anyway, it was a bill. I'd never seen a bill. It was during the Depression years. And asked me to go to the train station and get him a box of cigars. So I did. And when I came back, I gave him the uh, cigars and the change, and he told me, I could keep the change, and it was several dollars. <laughs> now, I didn't meet President Roosevelt. I saw him step off the plane, I mean the train, and get into a convertible. But I did see an, a very interesting thing down on the field. They built a platform on the center of the field on the north side of the stadium facing the south side. They had a good crowd there, and he came in uh, the uh, west end of the stadium, you know, that runs into Lumpkin Street. And he was on a convertible, and there were all kind of people standing on the, the running board, and I think they were uh, FBI men, G men. And uh, somehow or another, he got up, climbed up to the platform, and in those days, very few people knew that he was an invalid, that he had been a strapping fella, tall strapping fella, but in his younger days, uh, I don't know, I think he was out of college when he got infantile paralysis. But anyway, he stood up straight and made a great talk. I don't remember what he said. But uh, when he left, I'll, I'll always remember when he left, uh, his convertible stopped as, just as he was going to ride out of the stadium area when another tall, handsome fellow he was mayor of Athens at that time, and he, his name was Andrew Irwin. And in 1920, he had been a delegate to the U.S. Democratic uh, nomination for president in New York. Uh, Ohio Governor Jim Cox, whose family owns the Atlanta General Constitution now, uh, was running for president and got the nomination for president. and. Um, Franklin D. Roosevelt got the nomination for vice president. And uh, one of the nominating speeches for Roosevelt was given by Andrew Urban of Athens. And this must have been prearranged, but anyway, the convertible stopped, and Roosevelt stood up, and he waved to Andrew Urban, who was standing over close by, and he says, Hi, hello, Andrew, how are you, my boy? And they shook hands. A great picture. I'll never forget you. that. And I guess, Coach McGill, uh, FDR had a relationship with us because he was down at Warm Springs, I guess, and so he felt a special relationship with Georgia, do you think? Is oh, that he certainly did, I'm sure. Yeah, he spent uh, a great deal of his life, and he died at Warm Springs. Died at Warm Springs. Uh, he died early in... Uh, 1945. I know I was in San Diego <laughs> Marine Station uh, getting ready to go overseas when he died. Had Truman succeed in his prayer. Well, we're talking about the 30s uh, in Athens. Talk to us a little bit about how the campus looked in, in, in the well, 30s and 40s. Well, uh, I hung around the athletic fields as a boy starting in 1931 fireball ball chasing, bad boy the baseball team in the campus. And then when I went to school, uh, I was a freshman in the 
fall of 38. Uh, practically all of my classes were in uh, what we call the academic building, right there by the arch. And I know I had English there under Robert West, math, Professor Strong, I believe, and uh, history in that building. Did have geography in another building, not far from there. And uh, journalism, of course, was in that area where the um, Terry School of Business is. Uh, they had half of it, and half of the other building was a journalism school. Uh, and we only had about 3,000 students then. And uh, everybody knew everybody else, and the professors knew all the students. And they would, when they called on them, they would call them by name. Those were the good old days. Uh, and there wasn't much on the south side of the campus, above Sanford Stadium, except egg, egg uh, school students. Connor Hall had been built, I believe and Sewell Hall had been built. And we had um, women students in, but my wife at that time, uh, they had women students, but they lived on the coordinate campus. She lived in Miller Hall, I believe, over there. That's the old, Na the, that's the Navy school. Out and now the property of the U.S. Navy. But it used to be, um, and even before women were admitted to Georgia, it was, a, um, they used to have a, women's school up there. I know Professor Jerry Pound, uh, the uh, grandfather of my uh, mother's sister, was uh, grandfather of my mother's sister's husband. Uh, Pound Hall up there on the campus is named for him. And his son, uh, Merritt Pound uh, Jr., used to be, uh, Merritt Pound the first, used to be uh, head of the political science department of Georgia, and his uh, son, Colonel Merritt Pound, Jr., uh, my younger first cousin, uh, after the World War, no, after the Vietnam War, came back to Athens and headed the ROTC program here. He's retired now. Uh, Talk about uh, you, the athletic I, field had moved from one place to another. Right, I was going to say, Hurdy Field was where it all started, right? Hurdy Field was our first athletic field. It wasn't called Hurdy Field then. It was a flat area uh, close to the chapel, in back of the chapel, and it was used for years for by military students, even during the war between the states. The students trained there and drilled there, and the first sports were baseball in 1886 and track and field. They were in 1886 and they were played there. And then um, in uh, 1892, in January 1892, we played our first football game against Mercer. But our most memorable game was against the second game. The only other game we played that year was against Auburn and Atlanta. We lost that one. But we beat Mercer. And the fellow who introduced football to uh, uh, the Georgia students, was not a football coach. He was a great chemist. He had got his graduate degree, he went to Georgia, he was from Milledgeville, I believe, and named Charles Hurdy. And he had gone to uh, Johns Hopkins to get a uh, graduate degree in chemistry, and he uh, saw football play, and he liked it, and he brought a rule back a rule book back, and he read the rules to the Georgia students that year, and uh, coached the team that year. He wasn't a real coach, but uh, and then he turned it over to, after that one season. But he became one of the greatest men in the history of the United States. He later developed the process by which paper is made from pine pulp. And that is certainly one of the greatest industries, if not the greatest industry in the world today. He didn't make a penny out of it, but a lot of people. <laughs> Charles Hattie. Our stadium, Sanford Stadium, the one that we all know now, was built in the late 20s. Is that right? Uh, that's right. Uh, we moved from Hattie Field 
the athletic uh, area moved in Hood, from Hoodie Field in 1911 and uh, to an area uh, at the end of what is Lumpkin Street now, down in the Tanyard Creek Hollow. You know, Tanyard Creek works, starts across Lumpkin and goes under the street at the bottom of Lumpkin, underneath the stadium actually, all the way into the Old Coney Hill Cemetery, Tanyard Creek. I've walked it many a time as a boy underneath the stadium into the area by the river. And, uh, but but uh, the faculty chairman of athletics in the old days when they played on Hurdy Field later was Dr. S. V. Stedman Vincent uh, Sanford. And they named the new athletic field down there in 1911 uh, Sanford Field. That was the first Sanford Field. And it was the grandstand, it was just magnificent in those days, was built for a baseball crowd. It had a roof on it. One stand, one uh, part of the grandstand went down the first baseline, the other part down the uh, third baseline, and it would seat over 3,000. They would put other um, bleachers when they were playing football games. That's where Bob McQuitter made his greatest record. He started his career on Hurdy Field, but he finished up in 1911 and 1912, and uh, 1913 too, he was Georgia's first All-America football player, a local boy, Bob McQuitter, Robert Ligon McQuitter. And uh, let's see, I've, let's stop this now, I'm rambling around. We were talking about uh, Sanford That's, Field, yeah. and then it became yeah. Sanford Stadium okay. later. Now, Sanford Field was used for football until Sanford Stadium was built a few, a few hundred yards down uh, east uh, to its present location. It was built and dedicated against Yale uh, in October 1929. It was a very hot day. I was a little boy, eight years old. I went to the game. Uh, I didn't know anything about football. In fact, uh, all I could hear was uh, talk uh, by older folks, the big game, big football game coming up. And uh, I asked my dad, could I be there? I wanted to play in it. I thought I could be chosen and play it in it. And uh, I put on my football uniform that I got for Christmas that year. And uh, Charlie Martin was our business manager of athletics, and he's the one who got the hitch started there. That's another story. And he was a business manager of athletics, a good friend of my dad's. And my dad wasn't a sports writer, but he was at the game because uh, it was a big deal. The governors of all nine southern states were there for that occasion. And uh, it was a big social event for several days in advance. And big crowd overflow. They seated 18,000 on the north side, 12,000 on the south side, overflow 30,000. And um, there wasn't any ticket for me, but uh, Charlie Martin told my dad he'd pass me through the gate. I got there after the kickoff had already been made. And I asked Mr. Martin, I said, where's daddy? Where's my daddy? He was in the press box then, which was on the uh, north side of the stadium in those days. Later became the president's box. And I think the president's box is still there, but it's double deck. But anyway, I ran down there and I saw my dad down sitting in the press box. I said, daddy, they've already chosen sides. And everybody in the press box, including the great Granlin Rice, they just laughed like heck. He said, well, you go on down there on the field. I mean, down there, there's a walkway around the field. You just watch the game from there. I didn't know much about football at all then. But I watched the game just walking around. And the thing that I most remember was at halftime, uh, Georgia's band was just a little ROTC military band. Didn't do much. But Yale had a crack band they had on white and blue silver helmets, and they were really snappy, and they played a tune I'd never heard before, but everybody in the stadium stood up when they played the tune. And I asked my daddy later what the name of that tune, he said it was Dixie. Well, the Yankees <laughs> came know, down and played Dixie for they, they knew what to get a good match, <laughs> yeah. And we won. We won Georgia the ball game. Won. Catfish Smith of Macon scored all 15 points. He got his nickname Catfish because on a day when he was a boy, they were fishing in the Oak Mulgee River and they caught a catfish and somebody uh, made him bet and he bit the head off the catfish. 
That's how he got that nickname. But uh, been many great games in Sanford Stadium. I'll say, the, yes. and, and many renovations in yeah, the last. Yeah, my dad also took me up to the chapel bell. He, he said, you want to go see him ring the bell? And I went up there as a little boy, and there was some boy big ringing the bell. He said, you want to ring it with me? And I jumped into his arms, and we swung out there and rang the bell. I'll never forget that in 1929, ringing the chapel bell. It was a big day. Big day, a historic day. Um, as we as we talk about uh, those times, Coach, t talk to me a little bit. I remember an old a baseball field out across from where the Georgia Center is now, off of um, off of Carlton Street. Well, but uh, that would have been later, I guess, well, in the fifties. Well, uh, our second baseball field or third baseball field, first baseball field was Hurdy Field. Then we moved to Old Sanford Field, but. During World War II, the U.S. Navy uh, built one of its four regional Navy pre-flight schools. The, the, the boys who wanted to be pilots came here for physical training. They didn't do any aerial training, and they built a big building where the uh, Sanford Field Stadium used to be. And they built it, um, they had drill hall in there, but they also had a big swimming pool in it that Georgia took over after the war. And the reason they had a swimming pool was the cadets would get up to the, the rafters, have a parachute on, and drop down into the water, and they had to learn how to get out of the paragraph in case they uh, jumped into the ocean. That was the reason that pool was built, but Georgia took it over. It was a swimming pool till they later moved to a magnificent pool in the Ramsey Center. But the baseball field was moved after the war to uh, where the Coliseum is now, out in that area. And uh, that's where Jim Whatley won several uh, conference championships in the early 50s. And then it was later moved to its present site, uh, named for uh, Judge Frank Foley. It was named for Judge Frank Foley. Uh, it could have been named for him for several reasons because he and George Kidd Woodruff, who lived next to each other in Columbus, uh, uh, had been good athletes at Georgia. Both of them, Woodruff played quarterback in football. And Judge Foley was a star pitcher, left-handed pitcher, and uh, first baseman in baseball. But they really helped Georgia after the war in raising money for the athletic department. They were the president and vice president of the Georgia Student Educational Fund. In fact, when I started the Georgia Bulldog Clubs in 1950, they bought me a red and black station wagon to travel the state in. But um, Judge Foley was named, uh, uh, I mean, the Foley Field was named for him because uh, he was a great baseball player for Georgia on the team that was Georgia's most famous athletic team until the 1927 football team. And that was the 1908 baseball team on Old Haiti Field that won the Southern Championship. And Granlin Rice, who later became a nationally syndicated sports columnist, was, uh, um, he was originally from Nashville, Tennessee, went to Vanderbilt, but at that time he was sports editor in Atlanta. And he called the 1908 Georgia baseball team the greatest baseball team or any kind of athletic team in the history of the South. And it was known as our greatest athletic team until 1927 when we had the dream and wonder. George Kidd Woodruff was coaching that team. The dream and wonder team, they won its first nine games and then was upset. It was en route to the Rose Bowl. Uh, but Georgia Tech upset them on Grand Field. And Tech had a good team. They uh, went to the Rose Bowl themselves the next year. But it was some uh, 15 years later before Wally Butts gave us our first Rose Bowl team in 1942. We've talked. Claude wants us to talk about personalities. I want to ask you one more question yeah. about facilities, and then we're going to do that. Um, okay. We've talked about all. Uh, we've talked about it, a lot of facilities. We've not talked about the tennis facility, and we're we're sitting in the finest. Uh, 
tennis facility in the country, to my knowledge, well, collegiate-wise. Talk think about you're 100 percent correct. <laughs> uh, we moved out to this present location in 1958. Uh, tennis is a very old sport at Georgia. In the 1890s, they, they had boys play in individual tournaments. They didn't have any team matches. But the first champion of the South in tennis, Southern Collegiate Champion, the first championship was held in Montgomery, Alabama in 1898. And a Georgia boy won it. They would practice on private courts in town. And in those days, uh, every, almost every home had a private tennis court in the front yard or backyard. It was like having swimming pools now, you know. In the yard. And his name was L.A. Cothran of College Park, Georgia, and he defeated a football star from the University of the South in Sewanee named Sybils, but he was a tennis star too. And we have his, um, uh, L.A. Cothran's picture in our Hall of Fame here, and his racket, or the same model racket he used back in 1898. But the first tennis courts on the campus were four um, dirt courts on adjacent, uh, aside Broad Street, just below the arch. And they were there from 1900. Uh, I have pictures of those courts. And uh, as a boy, I saw them in the late 20s. Never played on them, but in the, they were there through the late 20s. And then they moved to a location in front of LeCant Hall. Uh, six red clay courts were there until uh, after World War II, and then they had four courts for the varsity right in back of the stadium. But in 1958, we moved to this location, and uh, uh, we began having uh, winning teams in the 60s and 70s, winning the conference championship. But we had big crowds, very big crowds. And uh, the chairman of the NCAA Tennis Committee, Dale Lewis of the University of Miami, was impressed by the big crowds we had, bigger crowds than anybody else had. So he let us have the, the committee voted Georgia host the NCAAs in 1972. Uh, that was uh, the first year. It was a big success because it was the first time in history there had ever been scoreboards on all 12 courts. We had 12 courts. The, um, Six court share, and no, we had 14 courts when they had the tournament. The six courts right here, four courts where our indoor courts are held, are, are now, but they weren't, they were outdoor courts then. And then four right above, we had 14 courts. A tremendous draw, and we had scoreboards on all courts. For the first time, fans could keep up with the score. And uh, the fellow who invented the scoreboard that we still have on the courts, uh, there's never been a better one. It was Stan Drobak, coach at Michigan State. So I asked him, I bought six uh, of his things, and that was 1972. We still <laughs> use some of the wooden score sheets that have to be replaced. But, and, then, and then he brought down eight for the other matches. We also had people, uh, monitors, keep the score and keep the scoreboard. And I got a lot of pretty girls to sit in the chair, and the, and the fans like that. And then, of course, for the big matches, they'd have real umpires. But it was a big success, and the coaches voted uh, 32 to nothing for Georgia to be the semi-permanent site. It had already been pre-scheduled over the next four years at uh, Princeton in 73, at Southern California in 74, and at uh, Corpus Christi, Texas in 75 and 76, but we got it again in 77 and have held it here most of the time since then, and we gradually developed uh, the grounds, made a beautiful place at here, had gardens, and the tournament was very popular here. And we're going to host it again next year. I was here in 1972, sitting in that picture somewhere, and I was spent most of my time snuck away from the admissions office to come sit and watch everybody play. And one thing about the NCAA's is that it has brought the most outstanding tennis players in the world. Well, uh, to, uh, to uh, so many of them, right to this day, uh, um, have gone on to international honors, won Wimbledon, and all of the Grand Slam tournaments, and been stars on the U.S. Davis Cup team the number one doubles team in the world right now, the Bryan Twins, uh, Mike and Bob of Stanford, who won the NCAA doubles here, led Stanford to the championship in 1998, 
and they are uh, ranked number one in the world in doubles and stars of our U.S. Davis Cup team. And uh, James Blake of Harvard, he's on the Davis Cup team right now. Um, he was um, run up in the NCAA tournament here. Of course, the ace of the U.S. Davis Cup team is Andy Roddick. But his bro older brother and his coach now is John Roddick, who played for Georgia. And I remember Andy Roddick when he was a little boy on the banks running around yelling for his brother and hollering, woof, woof, woof. And uh, yeah, we're very proud of the uh, 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 great tennis tradition we have at Georgia. And uh, the uh, Hall of Fame was located here because uh, uh, it was considered the appropriate spot since we were hosting the national championship. This is the Men's Hall of Fame, the Women's Hall of Fame is at William and Mary. Uh, it's a few years after this one. But um, the great singer, Kenny Rogers, gave us the money for this building. And he came to Athens, you know, uh, because he married the beautiful Mary Ann Gordon. He met her on the Hee Haw Show. She wasn't, uh, she never said anything. She just always looked pretty in the swing. She was the Colonel's daughter sitting out on the veranda swinging. And they were, and, and she used to help me in my office. Her mother was the bookkeeper in the athletic department. She'd come down to her mother's office in Vista when she was a teenager and her mother would call me up and says, I want you to put Mary Ann to work because I can't balance the books. She's getting them away. So I put her to work in my office. It was before we had stamp meters and she'd lick three cent stamps, fold up envelopes before we had I mean, fold up stories to put in news releases. And when she and Kenny were married, she brought him out here to be, I wonder if he could play tennis. I said, sure. And then he wanted to make a donation to the tennis program. And I said, we're trying to raise money for the Tennis Hall of Fame. And he gave the whole amount, $200,000. And I put a bronze plaque right out in front of the building, said, thank you, Kenny Rogers, for your contributions to college tennis. He said, take it down. I said, if you want it down, I will. You're the boss. He said, put another one up that says, thank you, Mary Ann and Kenny Rogers. <laughs> but anyway, where are we? Let's talk about, if, if I came to see uh, the Collegiate or the Tennis Hall of Fame, what, what would I well, find? Well, uh, we're proud of um, two things. We have the finest collection of rackets of any museum in all the world. I've been to the museum at Wimbledon and the International Tennis Hall of Fame at Newport. Of course, they have larger buildings. But we have, what we have in no museum has this, because this is just dedicated to traditions of college tennis. But we have the same model racket used by every national intercollegiate champion, singles and doubles, since 1883. Pretty good. And uh, about 75 or 80 of the rackets will actually belong to the players when they won. Now, when I step out on the court, to congratulate a boy who's won. He said, do you want my racket for the Hall of Fame? I used to ask him, but now it's such a big honor for him to have their racket in the Hall of Fame. But the racket used by the first champion, Joseph S. Clark of Blue Blood from Philadelphia, who played for Harvard, was riding this in a flat top. And we have that racket under his picture. We also have the racket used by the first American Davis Tup team, three Harvard boys, Holcomb Ward, Malcolm Whitman, and um, Davis himself, Dwight Davis himself. Uh, the, uh, we also have a great collection of pictures. Uh, we have over 1,700 photographs and murals, all are connected uh, college tennis, all of the champions, singles and doubles, and uh, all of the uh, collegians who have starred in the so-called Grand Slam tournaments, Wimbledon, the U.S. Open, the French Open, the Australian Open, Davis Cup matches. We've never had a Davis Cup team that didn't have at least one college boy on the team as a player or the team captain. So the college tennis has much to be proud of. And I love to show visitors. And any person interested in tennis is amazed by the collection. It's really kind of a well-kept secret. Not many people know it's on the campus. It's the only program on the University of Georgia's campus uh, that is honored with the National Hall of Fame. We're going we gonna to help people know that it's here. We'll do that. Coach, let's talk a little bit about some of the interesting 
personalities that you've known over the years, and, and one that you mentioned earlier was Coach Jim Whiteley, Big Jim Whiteley. Big Jim. Uh, he weighed 12 pounds at birth <laughs> in he Tuscaloosa, Alabama. He was pretty big at birth, 12 pounds. And uh, he was the University of Alabama's greatest all-round athlete. Adolph Rupp called him the best center he ever played against. His team's ever played at Kentucky. He was a home run hitting first baseman in professional ball one time in the minor leagues. He hit five consecutive home runs, four times in one game, and then his next time at back the next day he hit another one. That was five consecutive home runs. And in uh, football, he was an All-America tackle on Alabama's on Alabama championship Rose Bowl team. And his roommate in college wasn't well known then, but a fellow by the name of Bear Bryant was his roommate. He later became pretty well known as a coach. In fact, he could walk on water, they said. <laughs> but uh, Big Jim, uh, I really love Big Jim. Uh, when he first came to Georgia in 1950, he was a basketball coach. And uh, he was going to also be a line coach uh, in football. And uh, I remember in one of his first games um, uh, was against Kentucky in January 1950 in Old Woodruff Hall. And Adolph Rupp was the coach and a famous coach. And uh, uh, I went and, uh, with Jim the day before the, the game uh, to open up Woodruff Hall for Rupp and his team to practice. And afterwards, uh, Rupp, who liked Watley so much, says, how about a uh, uh, coming up to my hotel that night and have a beer with me. And um, he was an old Georgian hotel. And he said to me that I could come along too. Well, he drunk both me and Jim under the table. We never got any word, but we, he just told one funny story after another. He was a great storyteller. Uh, they'd offer up. But uh, Jim... Uh, was a fabulous fella. One of his favorite tricks, uh, he could kick the top of a door, the very top of the door, kick up high. And if the lights in a room were hanging low, he could kick the light bulbs out. And that was one of his favorite tricks, going to a room and unexpectedly kick the lights out and people thought the room was blowing up. <laughs> but uh, he, uh, uh, one of the funniest jokes though was one on him. Uh, he was coaching Georgia's baseball team and a uh, boy had hit two or three home runs in the game and the newspaper article the next day quoted him and said, what did he owe his uh, uh, success to? And he said, all my, all my success to the Lord, you know, praising the Lord. and uh, and. The next day at practice, uh, Coach Wallace said to the boy, he says, that's the biggest lie, bunch of baloney I ever heard you saying you owed all your uh, success to the Lord. You never have been to, in a church. He says, I bet you can't even recite, recite the Lord's Prayer. He, and the boy says, uh, uh, says, I'll bet you I can, and, and they put up money, put up about $5 a piece. And then Jim said, now let me hear you recite the Lord's Prayer, and the boy began. Now lay me down to sleep, I pray the, my, pray the Lord, my soul to keep. And Jim gave him the money, so I swear I didn't think he knew it. <laughs> 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 oh, Lord. Well, now there were some other interesting coaches during that time. Uh, oh, we had many. Spec Towns. Many colorful coaches. Spec Towns, Harry Mayer, Wally Butts. Uh, Herman Stegman was a great joke. I don't know why they used to pull so many jokes on each other. Uh, I think it's maybe it didn't have television. It wasn't those faster paces, isn't it? television, instant communication by computers and the internet and everything there is just a faster pace. And uh, it was fun pulling jokes on each other. And uh, 
Coach uh, Stegman liked to pull jokes. And uh, have I told the joke about him and uh, Clegg uh, throwing the football? Honey? Yes, I did. Did that in the, did yeah. that in part one? Yeah. Uh, did I tell about how Spec Times got his scholarship? Maybe I did. I don't think you did that for you did that for me, but I don't think you did that for the for the camera. Do that. Talk about how Spec got his scholarship. Well, Spec Towns. Uh, was born in Fitzgerald, Georgia, but he moved to uh, to uh, Augusta and he went to Richmond Academy and he played football. That was his only sport. He was just a skinny end. Incidentally, Specs really, uh, the full name was Forrest Grady Towns. He was named for Nathan Bedford Forrest, the great Confederate cavalry leader, and Henry W. Grady, who was an Athenian, you know, and then was famous as editor of the Atlanta Constitution and, and famous author. Um, but Speck uh, didn't get a football scholarship, George. He was just a skinny end. And he was, after he graduated, he spent a year or two driving a taxi cab in uh, Augusta. And he was arrested one time for smuggling um, illegal liquor across the Savannah River into Augusta. And the police ran him into a blind alley. He jumped in and stopped his car cab and he ran down the blind alley and they thought they had him because there was a six foot wall there, but he just jumped right over that wall. And the judge, Judge Miller in Augusta, whose son, Freddie Miller, played on Georgia's football team, heard that story when he was trying spec. And uh, he told Freddie, who told Coach Stegman about this boy in Augusta who could jump <laughs> six feet and he gave him a track scholarship. He had graduated in high school. And he, he couldn't get in school now. He wouldn't be smart enough. <laughs> but I couldn't either. But anyway, uh, he, uh, um, Coach Stegman gave him a scholarship thinking he could be a uh, uh, world champion high jumper. <laughs> but he was a pretty good high jumper, but he never could learn the western or eastern role properly. But uh, his Coach Ta uh, Stegman's assistant coach was Weems Baskin who had been uh, National Collegiate High Hurdles Champion at Auburn. And he tried to make a hurdle out of spec. And I saw him uh, try to make clear his first hurdle. It was in the fall of 1933. I'd finished my duties as bad boy and was hanging around the track field right there next to the baseball field. And uh, I was just chewing on Bermuda grass weeds, waiting on to finish practice so I could practice the pole vault. Coach Stegman said I could use that pit practice to be a pole vault after practice. And all of a sudden, I saw a guy hit a hurdle and hit the center track and come up cussing. I had never heard such cussing in my life. I had grown up at the Athens Young Men's Christian Association, yeah, and I'd never heard such cussing. I later learned who had even better cussing than the drill instructors at Paris Island. But anyway, uh, well, this, uh, Guy, uh, I found out later his name was Speck Towns, and uh, he used to call my. Uh, he had red hair, and I had red hair too. He didn't know my name, and for years he called me Red, and I called him uh, Speck. He had freckles all over his face, and that was his nickname, Speck Towns. And uh, two years later, though, he was the Olympic high hurdles champion, and he won the. Uh, set the world's record that stood for 14 years in an exhibition after the Olympics in Oslo. And uh, they uh, just didn't believe he'd run it that fast, and they were hesitant to uh, approve it, the International Track Rules Committee. But they looked at a movie of, uh, of a fellow from Great Britain uh, who they had recommended. Uh, O'Connor of Great Britain had been uh, recommended for his time, and they looked at a movie of Speck uh, in a race uh, at Oslo where he had done it in an exhibition, and Towns was crossing the finish line when O'Connor was just finishing the last hurdle. So they unanimously approved his record of 13.7, which stood for 14 years. Uh, Speck was quite a character. Talk about naming the track for well, the, uh, that Speck story. Well, Speck and I used to have, even though we'd known each other since 19, 
33, he called me Red, and I called him Speg. I didn't know his name, but he just said, well, I'm calling him Speg. And, uh, but we used to have an argument on how to spell his nickname. I spelled it S-P-E-C-K. And so did old timer, the Atlanta Journal sports writer. Uh, and uh, Speck spelled it S-P-E-C. And I told him, he said, I should spell it S-P-E-C. I said, no, that's a nickname given somebody who has bespectacles. He said, you got the name because you got more freckles on your face than uh, any trout in North Georgia. And uh, so we had a big argument on it. I just didn't give in. But when I got Coach Dooley to name the track out there for Spec Towns, he says, we want to put a sign up and call it the Spec Towns track. He said, hi, I know y'all's argument about how to spell his name. How do you think we should spell it? And I said, Speck was dead then. I said, oh, hell, spell it S-P-E-C. I don't want Speck jumping out of his grave. <laughs> 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 so Speck Towns track. He was a great competitor. Uh, Oh, good. Uh huh? Oh, yeah. When he won the Olympics, when West Spec Towns won the Olympic, coach and Mrs. Stegman were there watching the meet. Um, and uh, when Speck circled the, trout, uh, the track, you know, that's a habit. When you win, you circle the track. And when he saw Coach Stegman up in the stands, he knew where he was sitting. He stopped and he did like that, gave the victory salute, you know. And uh, the, uh, Hitler gave uh, the winners of the Olympic championship baby uh, oak trees from the German Black Forest. And Mrs. Uh, Stegman nursed that uh, little uh, sapling on the way back by ship. You had to keep it wet, you know. And when they got back here, the groundskeeper at the university happened to be an old German named Weinmüller, and he was from the German Black Forest, and he just loved to plant that tree. They planted it originally in back of the uh, north side of the stadium, but when they double-decked the stadium, they had to move it. Well, they did a bad job digging it up. Mr. Weinmüller wasn't around then, and uh, they planted it uh, over where the Colosseum is, and they've got a bronze or, or granite monument there to Speck, and uh, it died. But before it died, uh, Dean Tate, Dean William Tate, a great colorful character Georgia, he had um, uh, been a track man under Coach Stegman, and uh, he says we ought to do like they did the tree that owns itself. Uh, when it died, get one of its acorns, which my, that was my father's idea, to, for the, to continue the tree that owns itself legacy. So we got one of the, I mean, they got, uh, Dean Tate got one of the acorns from the original oak from the Black Forest, and that still stands there in front of the uh, bro, uh, granite monument to Speck. Talk to us a little bit more about Dean Tate. You know, everybody has a Dean Tate story. Yeah. Uh, let me see, I worked up, let me look at my notes on Dean Tate. He's in my book here. I know he, I know he, you mentioned he ran track, and I've seen those pictures of that skinny-legged fella who, uh, in his track, in his track suit. Yeah, here's Dean William, he was known as Wild Bill. I don't know how he got the nickname Wild Bill. But there he is in my book. Let me just look at some of these notes. Dean Tate. He married uh, Chancellor Barrow's daughter, Sue Fan. That's probably the greatest thing you ever do. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I want to tell about him. Um, Dean Bill Tate suddenly is uh, one of the most beloved characters in the history of the University of Georgia. 
longtime dean of men, but before that he was a track star. And uh, in the early 30s, he, he ran for Coach Stegman. And incidentally, uh, he succeeded Coach Stegman as dean of men at Georgia. Coach Stegman, after he had retired as athletic director, was dean of men a few years. And it was, uh, Bill Tate, who had run for him on the track team, uh, succeeded him also as the uh, dean of men. But um, Dean Tate was a champion long distance runner in college, <laughs> well known by the high school boys. And there was a young boy at Lanier High in Macon named uh, Young, Bob Young. And he was a state high school champion. And he would write Coach, uh, he would write Bill Tate for some advice on how to be a distance runner. And Dean Tate uh, sent him postcards and gave him tips on how to run. And then they were running in the Southern AAU mile race um, shortly thereafter in Birmingham. And uh, uh, Bob Young upset the great Bill Tate at the finish line in the mile race. And Coach Stegman uh, went up to Bill Tate after the race and said, how could you lose to a high school boy? And Dean Tate said to him, well, he had a better coach. <laughs> 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 but uh, uh, Dean Tate uh, uh, is certainly going to be well remembered with the beautiful uh, Tate Center name for him. But one of the greatest things uh, Dean Tate did, uh, whenever boys got in trouble at Georgia, students, uh, uh, he would be there whether they were right or wrong, he would be there to defend them. And I remember having to go to a little town near Athens, I think it was Lexington. Uh, one of my uh, tennis players had gotten some trouble and I had to go there early one morning. And uh, when I got there, there was Dean Tate already there to help that boy. And they couldn't have uh, honored a greater Georgian than Bill Tate. He told me so many wonderful stories. Uh, he used to regale me with so many stories uh, when I would carry him to Georgia Bulldog Clubs because he would, uh, I'd want him to speak there because all the alumni there at the Bulldog Clubs knew Bill Tate. And his, his most famous character on the campus though was a longtime dean of the law school, Sylvanus Morris. Uh, the Morris Dormitory is named for him on the Lumpkin Street. And his uh, younger brother, John Morris, was a famous catcher on Georgia's first baseball team and a longtime German teacher at Georgia. And they say he had the best arm that had ever been throwing people out at second base. And I know he had a good arm because when I took German under him, he uh, he was, uh, if you wasn't paying attention, he'd throw his black boat, or black boat eraser at you and hit you right in the head. And he hit me in the head one time. I wasn't, uh, I mean, I was paying attention because I knew that story and I was too afraid not to. But he was aiming at a boy in back, in front of me, who ducked and the eraser hit me. But Sylvanus Morris was quite a character and Dean uh, Tate used to regale me with stories on him. Talk a little bit, Coach, about Dr. Eugene Odom one of our most famous faculty. Uh, when I take people through the uh, Hall of Fame, I say uh, John McEnroe was a great left-handed tennis player. Uh, we have his picture on the wall in his racket. So Jimmy Connors was a great left-handed player. And of course, we have Connors' picture in the racket he used, uh, T2000, Wilson T2000. And, uh, but I said the greatest left-handed tennis player who ever lived, in my opinion, was the e father of ecology, Eugene Odom. He used to play tennis for the University of North Carolina. He coached the Georgia tennis team one year in 1944 during the war, and he won our Athens City senior, age 55. Uh, he was the greatest left-handed tennis player of all time, the father of ecology. Dean uh, Rusk, uh, I want to talk about Dean Rusk. Did I talk about Coach Watley? Yeah. Talk what about, about Dean talk Rusk? Talk about Dean Rusk, that's good. Dean fits you another caller, Coach. Huh? Do you need to get you another drink? 
Yeah, please. It's right into the room. It's dark in there. Watch out for bo for booger bass. Or booger bass. <laughs> <laughs> Just in there, in their little refrigerator. Uh, Don't have but one. You all want to share it with me? Oh, no, no, sir. <laughs> well, I want to talk about the boys who have given their lives for Georgia in the war, World War II. I think talk about that, and then we'll we'll. Um, well, what else? Finish it Thank up. Who's Dean Russ? Dean Rusk. That's right. Where we are. We'll talk to Dean Rusk, and then about the the veterans who, I mean, the soldiers who lost the lives in the Second World War. Georgia students class made about eight of them, four in Europe, four in the Pacific. And then we'll you want to we'll call it a day, and if we think of some other things, yes, we'll do this again. One of the greatest uh, um, teachers that ever been on the Georgia campus was Dean Rusk, Secretary of State. And after he had retired, he came down and was a teacher in the law school at Georgia. And there's a funny story they tell about Dean Rusk. When he first was moving into his office, the janitor greeted him. Good morning, Dean. He thought he was the dean of the school. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but I, well, we had the NCAA, it was during the NCAA championships of 1978. And I like to get distinguished people to give the awards to the champion and couldn't get anybody more distinguished than Dean Rusk. So I got him uh, to give the award and he gave the award to uh, John McEnroe when he won the tournament. I have a nice picture of them at that ceremony. But I sat with Dean Rusk uh, during the match and learned a lot about him. He was born in Cherokee County. I think his daddy was a minister. But he grew up in Atlanta. He, he played basketball and tennis at Old Atlanta Boys High. And then he went to Davidson and was a star in basketball and tennis. And then he was a Rhodes Scholar to England. And he told me in the early days of the Wimbledon Championship that he and the other boys on the Wimbledon team would be linesmen because they were having so many matches in the early rounds. And uh, a lot of people don't realize it, but in World War II, he was chief of staff, second in command, uh, Vinegar, General Vinegar Joe Stillwell in the China Theater, China Burma Theater. Well, he was his second in command, Colonel Dean Rusk. He was a war hero, too. And uh, he told me some funny stories on Chiang Kai shek because he met him, you know. Um, uh, uh, General Stillwell had his troops lined up with the Chinese troops, the Japanese, you know, had overrun. It almost wiped out China, but Chiang Kai-shek was the general for China, and he was with him, and he said, Chiang Kai-shek had the greatest group of bodyguards, physical specimens he had ever seen. All of them stood over six feet tall, and, were, and he said to get to be one of his bodyguards, a special group that bought his bodyguards, one of the tests they had to do was swim across um, crocodile infested river rocks and if they got across that that was proved they were pretty good those that lived through that that was one of their things and uh, but Dean Rusk was a great fella certainly one of the greatest Georgians and, and teachers in the history of the University of Georgia too. Talk then about we t you mentioned the war talk about um, I those, need that clipping. those folks you knew yeah, I need the clip, and I can't memorize the, all the dates. It's yours, okay. okay. Uh, one of the uh, most interesting and impressive uh, monuments on the Georgia campus is a memorial display of uh, red and black granite in front of the Rankin Smith Building, honoring all of the University of Georgia athletes who died in various wars. And I had the idea to do it because eight of my classmates died and uh, 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 suggested to Coach Dooley that he do it and it was done. And uh, eight of my classmates who, who died were uh, four of them in the Atlantic, across the Atlantic in Europe were uh, son of Homer Passmore and uh, another son of Tommy Witt, and a guard, Walter Chief Rook, and, uh, 
and, uh, and another God will be. And then in the Pacific, uh, James Skip Skipworth was an inn, and uh, two gods, Smiley Johnson and uh, Winston Hudson, and oh, three gods, a lot of gods uh, died. Uh, Winfred Goodman died. But the first one to die was uh, Army Lieutenant Tommy Witt. And uh, he died in uh, October 1942 during the North African invasion. I'll have to look down at this every now and then. Uh, while flying his B-25, um, he was shot down and died from wounds when he attempted to land his plane. On November the 22nd, 1944, Master Sergeant Walter Chief Rook, he was from down in Boswick, uh, in Morgan County. He was on our 42 Rose Bowl Championship team. He was leading a five-man patrol which was advancing on a German sniper position uh, in a stone house on the River Roar. When a rifle shot pierced his chest, he was awarded the Silver Star posthumously, the second highest honor that can be, be bestowed on an American fighting man. In October 1944, Army, Army pilot, Lieutenant Homer Passmore of Aldosta, uh, who had played center and blocking back in 1940, uh, was shot down over France while piloting his B-17 several weeks after the Normandy invasion. At the same time, Army Bombardier Lieutenant Will Boyd of Macon, a star guard on our first bowl team, the Orange Bowl champions of 41, was shot down by German aircraft over Italy. And on January the 17th, 1945, Captain James Skipworth, Jr., a native of Columbus and Georgia football captain in 1940, was killed while leading his troop in MacArthur's triumphant return to the Philippines. He was awarded the Silver Star for gallantry. One week later, January the 24th, Army Captain Winfred Goodman of Atlanta, starting guard at Georgia in 40 and 41, was reported missing in action after leading his fourth emergency ARC rescue squadron during the recapture of the Philippines. Four weeks later, February the 19th, 1945, Marine First Lieutenant Howard Smiley Johnson of Clarksville, Tennessee, an alternate captain at Georgia in 1939, was killed by exploding shell fragments in the landing on Iwo Jima. He was awarded a second Silver Star uh, for hand-to-hand -hand combat fighting on, against the Japanese on Saipan. And uh, I was at Quantico getting my commission at the same time Smiley received his commission. Uh, in June 1945 on, Oken on Okinawa, uh, in the last battle of World War II, uh, another fellow Athenian and fellow uh, graduate at uh, Quantico together, Marine Second Lieutenant Winston Hudson of Athens, a running mate of Smiley Johnson of Georgia, was killed while leading his platoon up a mountainside against entrenched Japanese in a cave. I remember some men, uh, in uh, Winston's platoon who later told me that he, he was down at the bottom of the mountain. <coughs> he says, I'm going to zigzag <coughs> up to that cave <coughs> where the Japanese were in a trench position. I'm going to zigzag up there, and uh, I don't want you to follow me until I give the all clear signal. Well, he got up there safely, zigzagging back of rocks, threw his hand grenade into the cave, but the Japanese, unknowingly, <coughs> had their largest supply of ammunition on the whole island. It blew the top of the mountain off, and Winston was killed in the concussion. But a few days later, his outfit captured the capital city of Naha, and uh, Okinawa was secured, and that's where the Marines were, and where I was at the end of the war later, staging for the landing on Japan. And these boys all are honored with that beautiful red and black granite memorial in front of the Rankin Smith Center. You ought to go see it. You've seen it, Alan. Yeah. Well. Oh, Coach McGill? 
let's talk a little bit about you. You've won countless honors for all of your accomplishments. The Hartman Award, the National Football Foundation's Outstanding Contributions to Amateur Football, that's just to name a couple. Your name's on this wonderful tennis complex and on the press box at, at UGA Sanford Stadium. I also understand that your seat says uh, legend Dan McGill at the, at the press box. Is that right? Is that the way you're designated up there? Seat number eight on the 50, I know that. <laughs> Well, it would be appropriate well, uh, if it said later. Yeah, I've loved my life at, uh, in Athens and Georgia. Uh, you know, uh, just had so many opportunities here. So many opportunities growing up at the Athens Wild, great institution here. And hanging around the athletic fields, eavesdroppings on all the coaches just been. I wasn't an all-American athlete, but I was an all-American flunky in the athletic department. Well, we were lucky to have you. Yeah, and I, uh, uh, my mother was in the first uh, women's class at Georgia. You and, had told us about that. And quit, that. Uh, she was a, a valedictorian at Old Athens High. She was real smart. And she, uh, uh, but she quit school after her first year because I was born. And my father uh, didn't get to graduate at Georgia. On April 17, 1917, he was in an English class. There were only about 20 or 25 boys in. This was 1917. And uh, Professor Park, for whom uh, the building later was named, uh, or, or, or later another building was named, Park Hall, in honor of him. But Professor Park said to those boys, we had just declared war with Germany. He said, every red-blooded American boy to join the United States Army tomorrow uh, and fight for democracy. The next day, there wasn't a need for him to come to work. They'd well, all they join had, everybody the had Army. Gone. And after the war, my father didn't have a chance to resume. He just lacked about a month of graduating, but he did come back to Athens and work for a long time. Well, we're glad he came back. We're glad you're here. I, I, I think you have led a a busy, busy life, a full, rich life, and you're still continuing to do that. You're writing books and articles. Yeah. You're looking after My, the... Uh, I especially want to write a book about my uh, experiences in the Marine Corps because they really do have a wonderful uh, esprit de corps. And I just think uh, more people ought to know what a great esprit de corps they had. When I joined the Marines uh, the day after Pearl Harbor, I was then playing touch football from the Kai Fi house. On a Sunday, December the 7th, a boy ran out of the building. He says, the Japs have bummed Pearl Harbor. We're at war. And everybody wanted to know where Pearl Harbor was. It was a new naval base. And uh, I joined the Marine Corps the next day. They knew I was a senior in college, and they let me graduate because they wanted college graduates to go in a special class to be platoon leaders. They had to go to boot camp first. But uh, my daddy, you know how fathers are, he, uh, he says, why did you want to join the Marine Corps? And uh, I said, they have the greatest esprit de corps. They're the first to fight. He said, they're the first to die. But uh, I have many examples in there that show their greatest esprit de corps. Uh, the, you know, esprit de, uh, in that motto, Semper Fidelis, which means always faithful, faithful to your country, faithful to the Marine Corps, and faithful to your fellow Marine. And I have so many examples in that book that I. Now this is your, this is write. the book you're working on. This now? is a book when I'll, I'll finish it? writing, and I'm hoping it'll be published this fall. That uh, sounds great. Uh, I was mainly just doing it for my family to give them a little history, but some people read some of the stories and they thought, oh, I'll put it in a book. So I'll give it a try. That sounds great. Claude, have you got anything else we need to ask Coach McGill about? Well, well I don't want to say this, but my greatest honor was, Coach Butch used to say, was being National Negro Table Tennis Champion. <laughs> I played in the Chicago Open right after I got out of the Marine Corps at Great Lakes Naval State. I was visiting my wife and a little boy up there. They were staying with her parents who lived in Chicago there. And I went up to the Northside Table Tennis Club. I'd been state of Georgia, table tennis champion 10 times, and uh, played the longest point on record, hour in 58 minutes, uh, and uh, lost it, but I won the game. 
Anyway, uh, uh, in the quarterfinals of the Chicago Open, I played a, uh, a colored boy on Negroes. This is not for, don't run this in there, <laughs> but this is my greatest achievement. Coach Butts used to tell it, uh, introducing me sometimes. Uh, oh, after I introduced Coach Butts, I'd always follow up. Did you know Dan was National Negro Table Tennis <laughs> Champion? But anyway, to tell the story, I played a guy named Overton. He was the ping pong pro at this big Negro hotel in Chicago, and he had a little shirt. He had cross ping pong paddles on his T-shirt. Well, I beat him in the quarterfinals of that tournament. And won the doubles with a Swede named Thousand. Uh, but anyway, uh, got a little gold medal that says Chicago Open doubles, McGill Thousand, 1945. Yeah. But anyway, uh, Coach Buzz, after I'd introduce him, you know, he said, "Well, you know, Dan, he was uh, he was national Negro table tennis champion, and also." He was good at tiddlywinks. <laughs> I uh, think that's a great note to close on, do y'all think? No. <laughs> what an honor and a privilege well, to, have a, to, to be able well, to do this. Well, I love to talk about those good old days.